as much as terrorists are killing people. Over 450,000 people die each year from tobacco. Okay. Uh, that's a, a, a lot of people. We have an alcohol that's responsible for many deaths. Caffeine and drugs are running rampant. Um, also, rich food and inactivity. Okay. So these are the things that the prophet describes that, and, and the reason why he needs to send Elijah because he wants to restore us back to the image of God. And verse 17.10, who is Elijah? Because the disciples didn't know who he was. And we read earlier in our scripture reading that he will prepare the way for the Lord. So how do we prepare for the coming of the second coming of Christ. Well, in Matthew 17, 10, it says, And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that, that Elias, which is another way of writing Elijah, must first come? And Jesus 17, 11, he said, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. Matthew 17, verse 12, but I say unto you that Eli Elijah has already come, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise also shall the Son of Man suffer then. And then the disciples understood that he spake to them of John the Baptist. So here's a, an interesting feature of Elijah. He says he will come. But his message will be rejected, and they will do with him whatsoever. What happened to John the Baptist? His head was cut off because he was speaking the truth. So the disciples understood that he was speaking about John the Baptist. So the coming of John the Baptist fulfills the prophecy of Malachi 4.4. And we read in Luke 117, and this is the prophecy of uh, Zechariah. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Brothers and sisters, Elijah's role is to make people prepared for the coming of the Lord. We suggest that by ourselves we are not ready. We need a message. We need Elijah the first coming. And John is a fulfillment in part of that prophecy. Because what did John do? He was a voice crying in the wilderness and he prepared the way of the Lord. And going back to that text in Malachi, it says he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just which suggests that before Jesus comes, his people, many of his people will be disobedient. And Elijah must come to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So it suggests that in the teachings of the fathers, what the Lord originally gave us, that if we're not careful, we can get so sucked up into the current climate of things that we are operating in a mindset where we, as Malachi says, if it don't change, I will smite the earth with a curse. Brothers and sisters, God is already cursing, but God sends Elijah to turn us from disobedient to the wisdom of the just so that we will be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Well, God wants to reach everybody with a message, a message of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And an angel goes forth with a loud voice saying, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment must come. So we have Seventh-day Adventists called into the scene in history 
as a fulfillment of Elijah. Because now, we don't look for a literal Elijah. We look for someone to come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And here's a uh, Prophets and Kings, one inspired writer writes today, in the spirit and power of Elijah and of John the Baptist, messengers of God's appointment are calling attention of a judgment-bound world to the solemn event soon to take place in connection with the closing hours of probation and the appearance of Christ Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords. How many doubt that Jesus is coming soon? When you look around you and, and you see how everything is deteriorating, uh, everything that the Bible talked about as signs of the last days are happening today. Soon every man is to be judged for the deeds done in the body. The hour of God's judgment has come and upon the members of his church rests a solemn responsibility of giving warning to those who are standing, as it were, the very brink of eternal ruin. And I want to pause here and say that, and I don't know if our personal ministry's director announced it earlier, but we uh, had an election of a Western New York uh, Federation uh, leader, and we're the only regional conference that has a personal ministries federation. Out of all the nine conferences, we're the only one. And the role of the, uh, of the personal ministries federation it's not that they do all of the work, but their role is to equip and mobilize the laity so that they can help finish the work. Amen. To work with the pastors, to work with the members. And so we have Dr. Ansa reelected to that post again. And I trust and I know that we will have much more activity in terms of evangelism in Western New York. And but we are members of that organization. It's not just a separate organization. We are the people. We are God's evangelists. We are Elijah. Okay? And it says, to every human being in the world who will give heed must be made plain the principles at stake in the great controversy being waged. Principle upon which hang the destinies of all mankind. We're going to talk a little bit about principles. A little bit about principle. We're going to look at one phase of Elijah. There are many phases that Elijah, the Elijah message addresses, but we're going to look at one phase. And we're going to talk about some sensitive things. But what I want to say at the outset, God does not call us to judge people. And uh, so when we hear the message, it is not to judge, but to educate. What did I say? To educate, because what God wants to do, and what your pastor wants to do in his own experience, as well as your experience, is to lift us up so that we are prepared and that we embrace and actually do better with some of those principles that are at stake in the great controversy being waged. Okay, so that's what we're going to deal with. In these final hours of probation, for the sons of men, when the fate of every soul is soon to be decided forever, the Lord of heaven expects his church to arouse to action as never before. Those who have been made free in Christ through a knowledge of his precious truth are regarded by the Lord Jesus as his chosen ones, favored above all other people on the face of the earth. And he is counting on them to show forth the praises of him who called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. The blessing which are so liberally bestowed are to be communicated to others. The good news of salvation is to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. In the visions of the prophets of the Lord of glory was represented as bestowing special light upon his church. What church? This church. In the days of darkness and unbelief preceding his second coming. As the son of righteousness, he was to rise upon his church with healing in his wings. And brothers and sisters, we are not relevant uh, unless we address, and I'm talking about as a church, the sicknesses that are all around us. When Jesus was on the earth, what did he do? He healed and he taught. Okay, and we can do no different. Okay? And it's not just about slapping somebody on the head and saying, be healed. 
There are some natural ways that we can be healed. And there are some natural laws that God has given that he expects us to value and to appreciate. And so he will rise with healing in his wings. And from every true disciple was to be diffused an influence for life, courage, helpfulness, and true healing. The coming of Christ will take place in the darkest hour of Earth's history. The days of Noah and Lot picture the condition of the world just before the coming of the Son of Man. The scriptures pointing to this time declare that Satan will work with all power and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. And so, who is the Elijah generation? You are the Elijah generation. And now we want to uh, focus on John the Baptist. And I've asked, I didn't ask, but I wanted to give you a presentation of uh, uh, a part of a message that was given um, uh, some years back, a couple of years back, at the Pioneer Memorial Church in Bering Springs, Michigan, Andrews University. So we're going to go to that clip and just to look at uh, who is Elijah, John the Baptist. We are the John the Baptist generation. So the question is, what kind of people should we be? So let's let's uh, listen. I'm going to ask us to uh, prepare for the sound. Consumption. 
I know what you're thinking, oh great, you mean John the Baptist was munching on little Jiminy Cricket grasshoppers for his diet? Well, one could draw that conclusion from the text. However, and this is a huge however, listen, prove this please, the Bible commentary, in, in a four-page essay with double columns, by the way, the Bible commentary on this matter deals with eight lengthy but persuasive reasons why the early church fathers and many contemporary scholars have concluded that in fact Lotus here refers to the Ceratonia Civiqua. The Ceratonia Civiqua. That's the Latin scientific name for the carob tree. In fact, those of you from Germany and those of you that speak English, in English and German, that tree is still referred to as St. John's bread. Yeah. The carob pot in Arabic today is still called the locust because of its horn-like protrusions, which is why the Greeks still refer to the carapods as little horns, just like the horned locust. Eight historical convincing arguments, I haven't shared them with you, just a smattering in that brief breath. But adding to those eight arguments, let me, and let me submit a sentence from a century ago suggesting that this is indeed the carob fruit. A century ago, these words were written. Take a look at them. John's diet, purely vegetable, of locust and wild honey, was a rebuke to the indulgence of appetite and the gluttony that everywhere prevailed. So, a vegetarian diet of carob pods and wild honey. Now, what is up with that? Enter now, please. Some of the most recent study that has been done regarding the American diet and our national mortality. I hold it right here in my hands. Brand new book copyright this year. A book written by Joel Furman, MD. He is a board certified family physician who specializes in preventing and reversing disease through nutritional and natural methods. Title of the book, you can see it there, Eat to Live. I heartily recommend this book to you. I'm grateful to my friend and colleague, Skip McCarty, who loaned me his copy of this brand new book. Now, Dr. Furman's fascinating, troubling conclusions can be best summed up, summarized in two graphs that he uh, enters into his, his uh, research report. Let's put graph number one on the screen, please. This is a graph. Take, take a careful look at this. This is the U.S food consumption by calories, okay? We as Americans, what percentage of our diet goes to this, that, and the other? You see the legend? Let's take the largest segment, that almost maroon segment. 51% of the American, of our caloric intake of the American diet comes from refined, you see that, refined and processed foods. These would include breads, pastas, cakes, cookies, chips, candies, pizzas, donuts, fast food, pastries, foods created by the mixing of flour, sugar, and oil, in other words, everything you like is in that first uh, category. You got that? Yeah. 51% of the American diet. Now, not too far behind. 42, keep looking at the graph, 42% of our caloric intake is because we consume fo food that are dairy and animal foods. These would include meat, fish, milk, eggs, butter, sour cream, cheeses, pizzas and nachos, ice creams, milk, chocolates, and everything else university students live on. All right, so that's 42% of the American diet. There's only one second left. Look at that little sliver of a pie. 7% is devoted in the American diet to fruits and vegetables. These would include fiber-rich fresh fruits, leafy plants, garden field vegetables, beans, whole grains, raw nuts and seeds. And by the way, even that number is higher looks higher than it really is. Put on the words of Dr. Furman, please. Almost half of all vegetables consumed are potatoes, and half the potatoes consumed are in the form of fries or chips. Look at that. Furthermore, oh my, you should have started on this. Furthermore, potatoes are one of the least nutritious vegetables. The same studies that show the anti-cancer effects of green leafy vegetables and fruits and beans suggest that potato-heavy diets are not healthy and show a positive association with colon cancer. 
Now, hold on. Excluding potatoes, Americans consume a mere 5% of their calories from fruits, vegetables, and legumes, end quote. Not exactly a diet to write home about. Now, is it? We're being killed by the small print. That's why. Leading Dr. Furman to conclude, read along with me, from convenience foods to fast food restaurants, our fast-paced society has divorced itself from healthful eating. The result is that we are sicker than ever and our medical costs are skyrocketing out of control. I insist that a low consumption of unrefined plant food is largely responsible for our dismal mortality statistics. Most of us perish prematurely as a result of dietary fall. If that graph doesn't make a believer out of you, I promise you the second graph will. Let's put graph number two on the screen, please. This is charting 12 nations and their relationship to the killer diseases of heart disease and cancer. Okay, the top two killers, heart disease, stroke, and cancer. Unrefined plant food consumption. Now here's how to read this graph. It doesn't take rocket science. You can just look at that. The dark blue, okay, the dark blue is the consumption of vegetables, fruits, and leafy greens, all right? The light blue is the death rate from heart disease and cancer. It starts on this side with hunger. Right after Hungary is the U.S. of A. All right? Notice what happens. Look at that graph. Note carefully that as the consumption of fruits and vegetables increases, the national mortality rates for these killer diseases dramatically decreases. Do you, do you see what's happening there, folks? It's going in the opposite direction, right? The more vegetables they eat, the lower. I tell you, get Laos, Thailand, and Laos at the very end. Look at that. Leading Dr. Furman to conclude, let's put Dr. Furman back up on the screen. Based on an exhaustive look at research data from around the world over the past 15 years, my recommendation, all right, here is a specialist now. My recommendation is that your diet should contain over 90% of calories from unrefined plant food. Hold on. This high percentage of nutrient-dense plant foods in the diet allows us to predict freedom from cancer, heart attacks, diabetes, and an excess body weight. Fruits, vegetables, and beans must be the base of your food pyramid, otherwise you'll be in a heap of trouble down the road. Whoa. Ladies and gentlemen, you simply cannot argue against the evidence. You say evidence for what? Compelling evidence showing that the, the divine diet given to the human race in the beginning at creation still remains the most successful prescription and predictor for human longevity and optimum health. God has had it right from the beginning. We're the ones in the end that don't have it right. You say, oh, come on, white pastor, please. I am a vegetarian. I am fine, thank you. All right, Mr. Ms. Ms. Vegetarian, let me ask you a question. How much animal product? How many animal products do you consume? You know, milk, cheese, ice cream, butter, sour cream. Aren't, aren't, those, all, aren't, aren't, aren't those all animal products? Oh, yes, they are. Listen to Dr. Joe Furman. Let me repeat this again to be clear. Following a strict vegetarian diet is not as important as, as eating a diet rich in fruits and vegetables. A vegetarian whose diet is mainly what you are about to read is the typical Adventist diet, all right? A vegetarian whose diet is mainly refined grains, cold breakfast cereals, processed health food store products, vegetarian fast foods, oh, how careful I am. White rice and pasta will be worse off than a person who eats a little chicken or eggs, for example, but consumes a large amount of fruits, vegetables, and beans. End quote. He has just described, ladies and gentlemen, the typical Adventist diet. Correction. He has just described the typical Adventist potluck. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. No, 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 no. We do not eat beans. But instead, to make up for it, we consume inordinate 
compounds of animal dairy products, vegetarian, vegetarian fast food, refined sugar desserts. Mm -mm. Hit the pause button right there. Dr. Furman has, has analyzed the sugar consumption in this nation. The national average right now of added sugar, okay? That's not the lactose fructose that's, the, that's already here, all right? 32 teaspoons a day is being added to the average American's diet. I want to talk about the kids that live on this campus. You know those 12 ounce cans that you get in the dispenser down in the basement of the dorm? 12 ounce cans? Nine teaspoons of sugar in one 12 ounce can. Hmm. You know what? You know what they're discovering? Teenage girls. We have a few teenage girls now because they now no longer drink milk and no longer drink water but consume pop are setting themselves for an early onset of osteoporosis. What's going on here? No, what's going on? We eat inordinate amounts of animal dairy products, vegetarian fast foods, refined sugar desserts, processed health foods, salty fake meats. Mm -mm. Oh, no. Refined bread and fiberless pasta. And many of us, if we were honest, many of us will have to admit that cheese has become our staple. It is the Adventist meat. Cheese. <laughs> Don't take my word for it. Dr. Herman, would you speak again to us, please? Cheese has more saturated fat and more hormone-containing and hormone-promoting substances than any other food. And the incidence of our hormonally sensitive cancers has skyrocketed, leading Dr. Furman to conclude, cheese, get this please, cheese is one of the most dangerous foods in the world to consume. Though it tastes good, it should be used very rarely if at all. Ladies and gentlemen, look, I I'm stepping on my own toes like crazy here. I know, I know. But you know what? This is the point. We have for too long hidden behind our vegetarian front. Hey, I'm a vegetarian. The problem is our vegetarian front is extending further and further and further. The time has come for us to prayerfully consider the implications of the relaxed vegetarian diet that we have corporately embraced. Furman, who notes Seventh-day Adventists, their diet and their, their, their choice of health priority, Furman writes, take a look at this. Remember now, long-term vegan, and these words are history explained vegans, strict vegetarians, remember long-term vegans, strict vegetarians who consume no dairy or other foods of animal origin almost never Get heart attacks. He then cites William Castelli, M.D., director of the famed Framingham Heart Study in Massachusetts. All right? Now, this is Dr. Castelli. We tend to scoff at vegetarians, it means vegans, but they're doing much better than we are. Vegans have cholesterol levels so low, they almost never get heart attacks. Their average blood cholesterol is about 125, and we have never seen anyone in the Framingham study have a heart attack with a level below 150. End quote. Now here comes Furman again. The research shows that those who avoid meat and dairy have lower rates of heart disease, cancer, high blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity. The data is conclusive. Vegetarians live longer in America, probably a lot longer, end quote. Why is it that vegans live so long? It's interesting, this, this is amazing. Dr. Furman goes to the 1984 California Seventh-day Adventist study. Remember they studied back in 1984. And by the way, I need to just put it, insert this. You, do you know that they're doing, they are repeating the study now, and it is now continent-wide? Many of you have already filled out the form. This allows me to give a plug to those of you who are here, those of you who watched. You can contact, you can contact Loma Linda and become a part of what will be an ethical study, I believe. You'll get the form. You'll fill out the form. Anonymous, anonymous. Send the form back in. They'll tabulate the results. You get these at, our, at any creepy station as you leave today. Pick up one of these. I'm a little slow myself. I'm going to send off a mark. 
we need to get the, the research done. Citing the California 1984 study, here is, here is his conclusion based on Adventists in California. Put it on the screen. Leafy greens, the most nutrient-rich foods on the planet, were the best predictor of extreme longevity. It is the large quantity of unrefined plant food that grants the greatest protection against developing serious disease. Oh, well, I want to tell you something, Pastor. I'm still young and I got time. Listen carefully. Young adult at Andrews University and parents and parents of young children. Vermin site studies that now show that the reproductive cancers, that would be prostate cancer, that would be breast cancer, these cancers, I'm quoting it now, are strongly influenced by how we eat earlier in life, especially right before and after puberty. Come of age reproductively, right there, right there. The diet is making a significant impact on how healthy you turn out years down the road. That's why it's so vital for our university students and young parents to take seriously the skyrocketing evidence for a diet dominantly consisting of fruits, vegetables, beans, and grains. One last word from Dr. Furman. Let's put him on the screen. He writes, the diseases that afflict and eventually kill almost all Americans can be avoided. You can live a high quality, disease free life and remain physically active and healthy. You can die peacefully and uneventfully at an old age as nature intended to achieve the results in preventing and reversing disease and attaining permanent healthy body weight. We must be concerned with the nutritional quality, emphasis is the nutritional quality of our diet, end quote. So what does that have to do with the John the Baptist generation? I want to tell you something. It has everything to do with the John the Baptist generation. You know why? Because for the John the Baptist generation, what we eat and drink is truly a mortal and moral issue. Diet is a moral issue. I want to close by giving you two reasons why diet for you and for me is a moral issue. Reason number one, our diet concerns God's call to holiness. I am God's temple. Open your Bible, please. Once again, to the Holy Scripture. Open your Bible, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Take a look at this. We'll pick it up in, uh, let's pick it up in verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body which belongs to Christ and join it to a prostitute? Never, Paul explains. And don't you know that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say that two are united into one, verse 17. But the person who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Now watch verse 18. So, run away from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body, verse 19. Or don't you know? That your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I were bought with a high price. What was the price? The last coagulating drop of Christ's blood was the crimson currency that bought us back. Somebody has bought our bodies. Have you been following this? Just, just a sad, sad, tragic story coming out of Seattle. The Green River killed 38 women and killed 38 prostitutes. And they had to read a statement in court this last week. I did it because I didn't want to pay for having used their bodies. Let me tell you something. There's someone in this universe who paid, paid to have access to your body. Your body. My body. I bought you with a price. See these scars? I bought you. You are not your own anymore. You belong to me. I am God's temple. 
You know what Jesus is saying at Calvary? I wholly, I gave myself wholly for you. Now you give yourself wholly, wholly for me. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, worship team, for some, some stirring praise line on focusing on holiness. What is holiness? It's right there. You give yourself wholly back to the one who's already given everything for you. Your body is mine. I own it on a Saturday night. I own it on a Monday night when you're studying late. I own it on a Wednesday night when you're pulling an all-nighter. I own your body. I bought you with a price. You are wholly mine. As I have been holy years. Which is why Paul explains, by the way, oh, let's, let's just look at this. You've got to see it in your own Bible. Romans, just a few pages back. Romans chapter 12. Just the, the first two verses, please. Romans chapter 12. Because the body has been bought. That's why you have Romans 12, verse 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them, your bodies, be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind you will accept. When you think of what he has done for you, is this too much to ask? Verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will know what God wants you to do, and you will know how good and pleasing and perfect His will really is. I'm telling you what, ladies and gentlemen, when God says you are designed to operate at an optimum efficiency with this diet, He isn't trying to be a party pooper, party pooper. He's trying to ensure that you and I can live on the cutting edge of human existence. Perfect. Well, how pleasing, Paul says. You cannot allow your appetite to rule you with abandon. What goes in your mouth and how frequently it goes into your mouth is a moral issue. It is. Which is why 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, Paul says, look at whether I eat or whether I drink or whatever I do, I do all to the glory of God. All right, two reasons. I want to end the second reason. Two reasons why diet is a moral issue. Reason number one, our diet concerns God's call to holiness. I am God's temple. Reason number two, our diet concerns God's call to readiness. I am God's witness. See, just as he did with John, God is calling for the John the Baptist generation to become fitted for his strategic, get ready world for the soon coming Messiah mission. That's our mission. Our minds, our bodies need to be in optimal condition and in constant availability. i tell you why, i tell you what, that is the reason why this generation cannot afford to become sluggish, half dead, inebriated, mentally distracted by physical, preventable dysfunctions and diseases. What is disease? It's a disease. I'm no longer at ease. I need you, God says. I need you to go for me now. But if like the great cross-section of America, because of our diet, we are physically debilitated and mentally dysfunctional or spiritually dying, to what generation is God supposed to turn to? Shall he have to wait for the next generation? He does not have to wait. I believe the next generation is here and now and your ex. You don't have to wait. You don't have to make those graphs extend. You don't have to drive the bars high. Well, we'll wait till our children come along. They'll know you are it. You are the generation. The John the Baptist generation. What did the angel Gabriel tell Zachariah, the father of John? Remember these words? Luke 117, to make ready. That's his mission. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I need, you to, I, need, I need you to just lock in now. I need you to think through this last moment with me. It is precisely that readiness that makes our diets a deeply moral issue. Now remember, come on, small print. We are not being called to judge one another. Each of, each of us must answer to God for himself, for herself. But ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have to confront our own carelessness with diet and our inability to control our own appetites. And by the way, that goes all the way to the top of the world church's leadership. And all the way down to you and me. Nobody gets a pass because of a position in the church. Everyone. Oh, and 
out of control diet is truly and deeply a moral and spiritual issue. You know why? Because I robbed God. God says, man, you had you, know, you had five more years on that rubber. You burned your wheels these last months. Do you know what I've wanted to do in your life? You burned yourself out. If I take from God what is what He has invested in me and I squander it, robbery is a moral issue, is it not? It is a moral issue. Remember the small print? The only diet you must answer for is your own. The only appetite you must control is your own. Just like John. Look at said, honey, lean. Natural diet. The end of this quotation, desire of ages. Take a look at this. Desire of ages. In preparing the way for Christ's first advent, John was a representative of those who are to prepare a people for our Lord's second coming. Now this is back in John's day. No, this is today. The world is given to self-indulgence. Errors and fables abound. Let me hit the pause button right there. I know you watch advertisements like I do. You've seen them. Does it not amaze you at how blatant the American food industry is in appealing to our basest appetites? So that you have ads now, fast food ads, we are now open to one o'clock. In the morning, the bell still rings for you. One o'clock in the morning. Come on in and buy that food you just watched late night TV. Have a little snack before you go to bed because you know why? Then your stomach will never get to rest. Your stomach will be working 24-7 and you will die young and no longer be a problem for me. So eat to your heart's content. It is so blighted in the American food industry. It gets, you want to talk about American pharmaceuticals? This one really gets me. Have you seen these ads? Yeah. The ads say, have a little group. Have a little reflux action with the food you love. Well, now we've got a drug that if you will swallow this before you eat that food, you can, you can go on consuming what has caused that gas, let's just call it by its right name, Cause that gas in the first place. Eat to your heart's content. Swallow the pill and we'll help you live. Because we know. No, they don't know. Someone else knows that if I can keep American Adventists eating and eating and eating, I don't eat me. Not a big problem for me. Eating and eating and eating. Then I'll take an entire generation down early. Go. Adios. Next. In preparing the way for Christ's first advent, John was a representative of those who are, who are to prepare a people for our Lord's second coming. The world is given to self-indulgence. Errors and fables abound. Satan's snares for destroyed souls are multiplied. All who would perfect holiness. Reason number one, moral reason number one for diet. All who would perfect holiness in the fear of God must learn the lessons of temperance and self-control. The appetites and passions must be held in subjection to the higher powers of the mind. This self-discipline is essential to that mental strength and spiritual insight which will enable us to understand and to practice the sacred truths of God's word. One sentence more for this reason. Temperance. You know what temperance is? It's self-control. It's controlling your appetite. That's what temperance is. For this reason, controlling your appetite finds its place in the work of moral reason number two, preparation and readiness. Holiness and readiness. Preparation for Christ's second coming. Just like John. No, 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 no. No, just like Jesus. Who in the face of a searing, almost overpowering temptation for his appetite, after 40 days and night of no food is faced by the same tempter who comes to you, the same tempter who begs you to eat, the same tempter who says, please take it, drink it, eat it. You've got to have it now. Don't worry. Just take it now. The same tempter gave you Christ. And what did Jesus say? In the face of that tempter, what did he say? It is written. One does not live by the power of appetite alone. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And what is the word out of the mouth of God? But by 
Boy, that body belongs to me. Woman, your body belongs to me. Your diet is my concern. Obey me, and I will prepare you for my imminent return. Obey me. Would you know it? Leave this place. Right on time, Newsweek Magazine, the current issue, a few days in advance. In fact, cover story, can you see it? God and health. What's the big deal? I'll tell you what it is. Because even science now entertains the notion that God is very much wrapped up in human health. But here's the question. Will you let him, come on, come on. Will you let him be wrapped up in your health? Will you? We have some dietary choices to make as a people in this community right here. They need to be informed choices. I understand that. And for that reason, I've invited one of the most contagious, I'm telling you hands down, one of the most cheerful, winsome advocates of God's optimum diet I've ever met. I've asked her. I said, Evelyn Kissinger Cole, professor at Andrews University, would you please come on Wednesday night to House of Prayer? Because I can introduce the subject, but I can't finish it. You have the smarts to tell us how to live. And so Eddie's going to be here. This Wednesday night, 7 o'clock sharp. Don't come late. 7 o'clock sharp. She's going to lecture to us. Because we need to know. It has to be an informed choice. I understand that. You're, you're, you'll never take a preacher's word for it. I know that. So let's have someone tell us who knows. And by the way... Wednesday night, I'll give you the complete study guide with all the quotations and the graphs to our study this morning. Come Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, right here at the House of Prayer. We have choices to make as a people. They need to be informed choices, but ladies and gentlemen, they must no longer be deferred choices. We have got to start deciding about our diets now. Not mañana. Not mañana. Now, we have to start deciding. Remember that story we shared just a few days ago, a few weeks ago? The story about that schoolboy who was late to the school bus. You remember that? He's late to the school bus. He comes racing up. The bus disappears. man standing in the shadow said, oh, sorry, son. Looks like you didn't run fast enough. To which the boy, you remember, shut back him. Oh, no, sir. I ran fast enough. I just didn't start soon enough. You remember that? Ladies and gentlemen, may I say that when it comes to our health and diet, starting soon enough can mean the difference between life and death, physically and spiritually. That's a way to say We start right now, you and me together. I want to make an appeal. Would you like to join me? Uninformed, I understand, uninformed, I need more information. Would you like to join me in committing to a journey that will seek to be informed so that we might live as Christ would have us live and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I'm going to ask you to do something. If you're willing to join me, this is not for everybody, perhaps. If you're willing to join me, I'm going to put you on the spot. Would you be willing to stand? And by standing, saying to your husband, saying to your wife, saying to your roommate, saying to your friends, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to find how to live the best I can live for His own. Hmm?
after hearing this and say, I'm not going to do anything. You know what? You're, you have become a fulfillment of Malachi 4. He can't turn the heart of the fathers to the children and to the wisdom of the just. God is trying to give us wisdom. But there are implications with this. I'm going to share with you uh, just quickly some of the implications, not only in our families, but also in our mission as, as a church. Now, um, some of you heard, this is recently, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the World Health Organization finally confirms the 120-year-old writings of Ellen White. And what was it about? It said that the, uh, It says that meat consumption was linked to mainly to cancers and colon of the colon and rectum, the second leading cause of cancer and death in the United States after lung cancer. But uh, uh, associations were also observed for pancreatic cancer. And this is just uh, validating what we have known for years. And the World Health Organization is the premier health organization, not only for the United States, but for the world. And they have come up with this, this finding. And I have another, uh, well, let, we'll get back to that. Uh, we live, our church is based in area code 13205. Based on statistics in Onondaga County, uh, we live in one of the worst area codes for health outcomes. In other words, people in our community are dying early, they're overweight, uh, they're subject to some of the preventable diseases that people die of, heart disease, cancer, and stroke. More than any other place in New York State, even. Well, I, I gotta speak for this, this county. Um, and so if we think about our ministry and we look at our purpose, why are we here? And if we have a community that's dying because of a lack of knowledge, should not we have some responsibility to, to try to help people to save lives? Especially in this area. Jesus Christ went to the worst situations. And here, in our territory, even where you live, this is the worst place for health outcomes. So what kind of program should we have? People are smoking. They're addicted and they, and they can't break free. Can we not have tobacco cessation classes? Can we not have, uh, you know, temperance classes? Shall we not help people overcome uh, addictions? Um, now let me go to uh, a next one. So when I think about the church, and, I, and I'll close on this, because there's, there's a lot here. They even have, you can uh, look at zip codes, uh, preventable hospitalization rate. We have more people going to the hospital for preventable stuff than any other zip code. In, in another county. So when we think about our position as a church in this particular community, uh, should not we have some kind of witness, as as uh, Dwight Nelson just spoke about, a witness? We have the Elijah message. We are the John the Baptist generation, and so when they come in. What should they see at our public? Okay, it's quiet in here now. What should they see at our public? Okay. They should, they should be something healthy, right? Because people are dying. We just heard it's a moral issue. Now, the General Conference, and I'm going to present this to the board tonight. Uh, list some guidelines about 
what should take place during the fellowship meal. And, 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 and a fellowship meal is a ministry, right? A ministry to the body as well as the soul. Uh, there are some guidelines that we want to consider. Um, and uh, I, I just stumbled upon this. Uh, and I just mentioned a few of them. Give special attention to the flavor, color, and texture, and shape. Uh, choose meatless recipes, which are delicious, nutritious, and attractive. Okay? So that's why the church, on a general conference level, has said, whenever we put forth a witness, we want to put forth our best. Especially in an area where people are dying from the very things that we may like to bring to church. Now, what you do as an individual is your business. But when it comes to the corporate business of the church and the corporate witness of the church, then it's got to reflect what we just heard. And I stand by that. I stand by that. Because it is a moral issue. Okay. And I'm just going to read a couple of things. Uh, uh, recipes should be given so people can learn how to do it themselves. Uh, it talks about if you bring milk, it must be uh, low fat, uh, low skim, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, limiting and omitting irritating spices and condiments such as black pepper and mustard from recipes. Promoting fresh fruit, whole grain desserts, rather than those high in refined sugar, refined flour, fat, and salt. Okay. So this is what the general conference says we should have. And I read somewhere else it says we should not have uh, rich desserts that are full of sugar. Especially when you have people in this church that are dying from preventable, preventable diseases. If we fail to ignore that, then we bring the curse upon ourselves. Because not only do we inflict damage on ourselves, but we are inflicting someone else. And God says, I don't like that. Okay. So what kind of witness do we want to be? Jesus said, if you take one step toward me, I'll take a step toward you. He doesn't require all of us to be perfect all at once. He's just asking us to be willing to go forward. Okay, so now is the appeal, based on where we're at, based on our community, based on our living situation, right? Will we make a change? Will we try, at least try, be willing? Will we reject everything? Or will we take some steps in acknowledging that God is the owner of my body? And that as a church, I support the church witness to make this church a beacon of light and help to this community. Now, if you believe that, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. We want to pray. God will give us the grace and the power uh, to be Elijah, to be John the Baptist. It is not about our personal preference. It is about God being honored. Whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, give all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, this is a sensitive message.